welcome to the latest in the series of Conway Hall's Ethical Matters. And this evening we'll be talking about a brief history of censorship from the ancients to fake news. Eric Berkowitz will be reminding us that the urge to censor is as old as the urge to speak. We'll speak for about 45 minutes, or Eric will, and then if you've got any questions, just type them into the Q&A um, section of Zoom and we'll get to them later, we'll ask him later. If for any reason you can't speak or you'd rather not, that's fine, just leave a little note that you'd rather ask me to answer the, ask a, the question on your behalf. Uh, meanwhile, let me just find out from Eric if everything is okay with him. Are you ready to speak, Eric? Is it all I'm I'm working? perfectly ready. Fantastic. Over to Eric Berkowitz. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. I wanted to uh, welcome whoever is out there to my dungeon in San Francisco. I wish we were in the same room. In fact, I wish I was actually over at Con Conway Hall because I understand, well, one, it's a beautiful place, but two, I understand that the desk of Richard Carlyle is there. It's a place I would dearly love to sit because I think it would make me want to start causing trouble as he did. We'll be talking about him in a little while. First of all, a little bit about me, because I don't think I'm terribly well known over there. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, I'm a human rights activist, I do a lot of asylum work, I'm a journalist, and I'm an author. And everything I do is built on the telling of stories. Stories either to persuade judges, stories either to inform through journalism, or stories in my books that help me tackle big subjects uh, taking a long, long view. And the books I write are not written for professors or for specialists or for historians, although they're all books of history, but for the smart audience looking for perspectives on issues that seem omnipresent now. And um, I've done two books on the intersection of sex, law, and marriage. Uh, sex being a rather basic drive. I, was, I wondered how it drives politics and social structures and what's, what stories come out of that. And of course, I've done this book on censorship. Now, it's interesting. Just a little while ago, I came upon a quote from an ex-editor of the LA Times, a man named Phil Kirby, who said that censorship is the strongest drive in human nature. Sex is a weak second. Um, I think he's onto something, actually. And I think he might have been writing about my career. Sex goes to how we are, but censorship really goes to who we are and how we arrange ourselves, how we view ourselves and our ideas. How we, how we view the ideas of others, how we arrange really our most basic family, personal and social structures. How did this book come, come to be? Uh, my editor in the UK, the most extraordinary Lynn Gaspard was batting around ideas with me and for another book. She published one of my first books. And there was this issue popping up in London, which I knew practically nothing about, about drill music. Um, which you all know, but I didn't, um, rather a sort of hardcore urban rap. And YouTube had succumbed to police pressure to take down drill videos. Uh, the idea being that the mere existence of these videos was um, an element of disorder, particularly it might spark disorder by the underclass, uh, some members of underclasses. That caused a lot of controversy, which Lynn clued me into. What's the value of the speech? Does it, is it actual expression? Is it, is it is violence, et cetera? And it struck us that these issues always come up as if they're for the first time. Every time one of these issues comes up, it's as if it never happened before. And we looked around and there were no books for the non-specialists dealing with free speech censorship issues, taking a long view. And we decided to do that. Now, my book goes from the formation of language to Mark Zuckerberg, in fact, the online safety bill that's now winding its way. I don't know how I got that in the last minute, but I did. Uh, and through that long time period, the settings change and the players change, but the issues and the themes remain very, very constant. Why is that? Because words and images um, exert power. And censorship really, really comes from uh, a sense of awe and a sense of threat from words and images themselves. Many in, early, in the beginnings believe that words uh, created the world and words can also destroy it. Words affect us. They cause action. They are action. 
you know, Ernst Cassiere, the philosopher, said that from the very beginning, words were seen as a mystical primary force from which all being and doing originate. To the Quitoto peoples of Peru, words gave origin to the Father, that is God, and then from that, God created the world. The idea is words first. It's really fascinating. We didn't create words. Words, in a sense, created us. We can't forget the Gospel of St. John in the beginning was the word. It is true, as uh, Deborah said, that the compulsion to silence is as old as the urge to speak, because as soon as people began to use language, they began to try to shut each other up. Words jar us, they hurt us like a loud noise. Words that jar our beliefs hurt us like a loud noise or a swarm or a swarm of mosquitoes. They, 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 we have this, and I've noticed it, and we have to look inside ourselves a bit with this instinctive impulse to stop those words or images that, that challenge us or that call us into question. You know, for governments, in, uh, tolerating dissent, tolerating words that challenge their policies has been seen to uh, imply approval, which challenges the status quo and which subverts the myths upon which their power is based. You know, even where free speech is cherished, such as in Britain or such as in the United States, we forget that free speech requires the embrace of discord. It requires the tolerance of speech that upsets us, that offends us, that hurts us for the common good. Uh, you know, we that's a hard thing to metabolize. And it's a hard thing to keep metabolized, especially when you're raised with all the privileges that free speech gives. Across history, that has not been the case. Censorship has been the norm. So here's the paradox. Censorship violates our rights, of course, but it's hard baked into us. We yearn to be heard. We yearn to stand on a soapbox and tell the world, just as we want to shut each other up. But first, I want to figure out also what censorship is, because it's one of these, it's one of these bleached terms that has been used so much in so many ways, it sort of lacks a common definition. It's not helped by the fact that few who censor admit to doing it. Napoleon censored the subject of censorship itself, <laughs> even though all knew that it was happening. The Soviet Union, uh, of course, guaranteed free speech in its constitution. And Facebook, uh, which operates what most agree and which I assert is the largest censorship system ever created, uh, calls itself a free speech platform, while Twitter calls itself the free speech wing of the free speech party. Quite a surprise, I think, to Donald Trump. And Google's YouTube in the first quarter of 2021 uh, got rid of 10 million videos for violating its own homespun, legislated by no one community guidelines. So, you know, censorship emerges from the Latin, the word emerges from the Latin senseo, which means to judge or to assess, which I think is a good place to start. In my definition, and that's my definition, censorship is one group or person exerting force, some sort of coercive force over others to control what they say, see, read, or write. They could involve licensing, that is pre-approval, they could involve murder, that is of speakers, damnation by churches, uh, some, erasure, social intimidation, as is very much the case these days, burning, or overwhelming commentary by troll mobs, which drown out what people say. It's all a form of coercion in which one person is silenced. And what's the result of that? Well, free speech and thought are what's compromised. What is, excuse me, what is the value of free speech? I mean, it seems self-evident, but, but Let's think about it for a second. Free speech, people have thought about this quite a bit and there's several ongoing theories. One is that the cacophony of allowing all of us to speak, um, through that noise, through that food fight, some truth is going to rise up and truth is by itself a good thing that helps us. So we need a clash of ideas as John Stuart Mill put it, to let the good stuff rise. Other people have, uh, posited that, that free speech is necessary for self-governance, that we can't elect leaders, call them to account, arrange ourselves without, we, without being able to express ourselves or have the information as to what governments are doing. But of late, there's another theory that's come up in the last six, seven, eight, nine decades, which is personal autonomy. 
free speech is necessary for me and you and you and you to develop ourselves, to become actual humans. That unless we could form our ideas and call them out, we're not going to be the people that we could be. Now there's risk to that theory. And I think it's really probably the most common one now because it involves me and then another me. It doesn't involve us. And so it, 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 it creates kind of an atomized view of free speech. And when personal development is the core of it, then someone's, other, someone's speech that offends us or that hurts us or that we, makes us feel silenced hurts our personal development. I'll be getting to that. Um, we need to think about that. What are the threats posed by free speech? Well, <laughs> that's what my book is about, um, but there are many. Uh, in 1819, addressing taxes, which were passed in Britain to eliminate effectively the popular press, that is the press written for the underclasses, generally by the middle classes, but for the underclasses addressing their concerns, Lord Ellenborough called the whole thing, all the popular press, fake news. He said it was mischief, a purveyor of delusions. And then unless the torrent was stemmed, society will be overturned. The statesman, he said, will be put at the loom, uh-oh, and the politician at the spinning jenny, oh my God. That is, free speech will turn things upside down. A reactionary French minister called censorship a sanitary measure, this is in the 1820s, called, this, called it a sanitary measure to protect society from the contagion of false doctrines. And in my book, I, I, I find that often that free speech is seen as something infectious, particularly in the religious realm too, something subversive, something that gets into our bodies and eats at us. And that's what censorship is often supposed to address. Now, given that these stakes of flipping society upside down or infection, uh, censorship has tr traditionally been a two-sided affair. On the one side, power, uh, guns, et cetera. And the other side, outliers, people who are vulnerable, heretics, dissidents, nosy members of the press, artists, et cetera. So gains for free speech, gains for expression were always it's almost zero sum, we're at the expense of government power. Well, lately we have a third element in, which I think has changed history, which is the social media platforms, which are sort of these transnational, which is where the action is, which is where speech has moved. And, 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 and they, have, they can't kill you, they can't arrest you, they can find you kind of, but they can definitely silence you. And billions and billions and billions of times a day, our speech is ordered, amplified, deamplified, moved around. And it's not for the good of society. It's not for truth or self-governance, it's for profit. We all work for Mark Zuckerberg. Our, 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 our online speech is there to create platforms for sales. And that's you know something that we really have to contend with is speech is now being tied to money as never before. And then, then there's also a fourth element, which is cancel culture, which is people just you know getting together and creating enough fuss that one person who speaks might lose their job or might lose their position or lose their enrollment or have some challenge. Or if you're JK Rowling, you'll take some grief, but then you'll sell a lot more books for it. Over the last decades, there's been a real shift. The liberal left to which I belong uh, has come to see the, the ones who champion free speech as a check on government, now we seem like to want it. You seem to want censorship to protect us. And we're calling on governments and authorities and Facebook to do that from harassment, from sexism, from, from pornography that upsets us, um, et cetera. We now seem to want free speech a check on it, free speech is seen as a threat, really, totally free speech rather than a good thing. Whereas the, the right has sort of assumed the mantle of free speech, I think falsely, but they're now the ones who are calling that. It's interesting. Um, I think we have forgotten, as I said, that free speech is, you know, requires discord and our rights to speech as well as our other rights are never marked by the well-behaved. I mean, the people who are watching this show are probably not going to get arrested in the next week or two, but it's the people who get arrested and the people who get prosecuted, the obnoxious ones, the hateful ones, the, the, the ones we don't want to have dinner with or be with, are the ones who mark the outlines of our rights. So to some extent, we need to be thankful for them. And, and you know, discord, free speech does mean discord, and, and I really believe that. Now, 
decades ago, I, someone who knows a little bit about this subject, Salman Rushdie, while he was in hiding, uh, get, wrote a story called The Auction of the Ruby Slippers. It's an okay story, but he inserted in the middle of it something that had nothing to do with really with the story. But I think it was a statement of what I was just talking about and something that he was experiencing in a very big way. He said, we the public, this is a quote, are easily lethally offended. We have come to think of taking offense as a fundamental right. We value very little more than our rage, which gives us, in our opinion, the moral high ground. From this high ground, we can shoot down at our enemies and inflict heavy fatalities. We take pride in our short fuses. Our anger elevates, transcends. Powerful stuff coming from him, and it's something to keep in mind. So my book is chronological, but there's overlapping themes that go through it. One, I've just been talking about the fragility of feelings that's both on an institutional level and on a personal level from Elizabeth I chopping off of the hand of a poor gentleman for daring to discuss her contemplated marriage to a French Duke, or even more pointedly her fertility uh, to President Xi Jinping's censoring of the image of Winnie the Pooh on the internet not that Winnie the Pooh will challenge the Communist Party's rule in any way, but he just didn't like that people were comparing his face to the little bear. So, you know, touchiness, causing censorship. <clears throat> Books are also seen as having their own agency and images. They're poisonous in themselves, from graven images you know, that were thought to be infested with demons to the iconoclastic rages that I cover in the Byzantine era, particularly in the French Revolution, where anything royal was seen as effectively evil, big attacks on the church, of course, and the Reformation. And now, uh, you know, swastikas and the N-word, these, there are certain things that are in and of themselves, even apart from what they depict, considered so radioactive, so poisonous, that we can't use them. I mean, people have lost their jobs recently in the United States, law professors, for using the N-word in its entirety when quoting a legal case against discrimination. So, there are certain things that are now shorn of context and are just need to be, we feel we need that we need to suppress them. Um, censorship has also been done in the service of truth or feelings, like all the fake news laws proliferating around the world or hate speech laws to protect our feelings. The problem is that these rules are often used for the opposite purpose. Fake news laws are now being used prodigiously to suppress truth and hate speech laws while they are sound good, are often used to suppress dissent. Um, we always have to ask when we have censorship, who's doing the enforcing and why? Censorship's also been used to mold or erase the past, such as the Holocaust denial laws. Um, also, there's a Polish law now that says if you implicate Poles in the destruction of the Jews during World War II, that is an offense. Recently, two historians wrote a gargantuan book studying the collaboration of Poles during the war, they had to publicly apologize, cultural revolution style, for that um, because they violated the law, which was essentially to bar the truth. Uh, I also covered the fact that censorship simply doesn't work. Uh, in most cases, the ideas survive as to, ex as to exemplars and the implication of, excuse me, and the impact of technology, be it the pr printing press itself, the telegraph or social media. But the bulk of my book, in this context, and what I'll be talking about is class aspects. Class aspects meaning not censorship not being used to erase speech, but to channel it. That is one group, the group in power decides that speech is unsuitable for another group, a group generally without power, uh, and that this speech or this information is fine for the censoring group, but should be kept from the other. Why to, for their own good, often they're seen as weaker to prevent them from getting uppity or corrupted. So that is speech isn't bad just for one, speech is bad for one group but not for another. And it really goes all the way back. In the ancient world, there's never, there was no concept of universal free speech. Well, there was no concept of free speech, but even when speech was allowed, it was always class oriented. Most pointedly in the free speech beacon of the ancient world, the ancient Athens, Queen Jocasta and Euripides' Phoenician women, lamented that it's a slave's lot not to say what one thinks. 
Okay, so she was bemoaning her own lot, but the truth is that in Athens, where free, there was more freedom of speech than anywhere, uh, it was only for a fraction of the population, that is male citizens, slaves, women, foreigners, uh, 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 no speech at all for them. So when Pericles bragged about the freedom of speech in ancient Athens in his famous funeral oration, he was only talking about himself and his confederates. Knowledge was also, has also been a matter of class, the sequestering, the, si the siloing of knowledge. You can see this in the third century BC when the first Chinese emperor was infuriated that scholars were criticizing him uh, using uh, Confucian, uh, Confucian scholars particularly. So what did he do? He confiscated all books, <laughs> all books of literature, poetry, philosophy, et cetera, kept copies for himself and for his Confederates, but barred them for everyone else. That is, he simply siloed all of the knowledge and all the thinking to keep it from being used to criticize him. In Cambodia in the 70s, it was a death crime to, to wear glasses often or to even to read. And in my own country in the 19th century, it was a crime in the South to teach slaves to read, that is, to allow them to acquire knowledge. In Rome, of course, the same thing continued. You know, Julius Caesar, for all of his faults, did set up the first Europe's first news sheet, the Acta Diurna, which was these stone tablets to inform people what was going on in the Senate. His successor, Augustus, uh, didn't like that and stopped it. So that came and went rather quickly. Echoing the uh, 17th British sense, uh, century British censor, Roger Lestrange, who, didn't, who said he didn't want the multitude too familiar with their superiors. Hmm. And he focused his efforts on the popular press, what he called masters of the, of the popular style. None of that, keeping the underclasses, the multitude too familiar with their superiors, not good, siloing information. Of course, it also arises, this, it blows up when the printing press uh, is invented in the 15th century and the reformation that followed. Printing shook everything at its core. I mean, censorship was self-executing. Um, before then, you know, manuscripts were expensive. They were hard to, they, 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 were, they were only one at a time. Literacy was obviously quite small. There was very little of it. And so it, it didn't take too much effort to keep books from other classes, but with the press, I, everything blew up. It, 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 there was no more control really. And it also created sort of a mass teaching. You know, the first books weren't always Classics, they were letter writing manuals, they were primers, they were math primers, there was sort of a acquisition of skills. Now, what did that do that caused an instant, instant visceral reaction by authority? The Archbishop of Ragusa in, in 1500, I think, put it well. He said, the world already had too many books. <laughs> Better to suppress a thousand without cause than to allow one that should be pro prohibited. And as collections grew, and as pamphlets, quick draw pamphlets were drove debates, which at a speed that was at what was for them warp speed on new ideas about science or religion or whatever, authorities responded with massive censorship efforts like no one's ever seen. The most famous being the Catholic index of forbidden books starting in the 16th century, which continued to 1946, but it wasn't just the church. Everyone issued lists of forbidden books. England, Austria, Charles V, France, so on. They all had teeth. You know, the people were killed for it. But at the same time, along with censorship became an instant black market. Once you forbid something, people want it, forbidden fruit. What we call in America, the Streisand effect. I won't explain it. But once something is forbidden, you know, publishers instantly told their writers, Write anything that will be forbidden. Why? Because you can, it'll cost more. You can get more of a profit. And no authority, no one could control everything that was going on within Europe. I mean, there were always borders, there were always limits, and they were porous. So from the beginning, as you know, as soon as lists were drawn up, so were so was a black market. And the king, black marketeer, the king sort of the first media star, the first illegal media star, of course, was Martin Luther who used plain language to challenge authority at, 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 you know, church authority particularly at all 
you know, all opportunities. The press was his weapon. His crowning achievement, of course, was a class crime of translating the Bible into German, into you know, challenging the church monopoly on faith. He was a constant target ban of constant bans, and he generally responded by burning those bans. I'm not sure I'll have time for this, but also printing created the instant pornography market, mass market for porn, which had never uh, been around before. You know, the unwashed could get their hands on what they uh, on what they wanted, and so uh, the Catholic Index, along with Boccaccio and 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 Machiavelli, you'll find uh, Pietro Aretino, the world's first mass market pornographer who made great use of that. Um, anyway, so class conscious, conscious class concerns continue to pervade censorship into the 18th and 19th centuries. The great British um, jurist, William Blackstone, doctrinized it in his commentaries. They sort of became law themselves. He, he said that the law requires due subordination of rank. So people would so people would be required to give superiors due respect and obedience, meaning that rank, as far as he saw it, was hardwired into British law. And he approved something called seditious libel, which is effectively any criticism of government or authority. He, you know, from his view and the view of the Brits is that it was not, at least after the 1690s, it wasn't correct to license something ahead of time. You, Books couldn't, didn't need to be pre-approved, but if once they were published, they were considered uh, dissenting, if they were a challenge, if they insulted authority, either church or state, that was seditious libel, and the writer could be mutilated, pilloried, thrown in jail, and the books, of course, suppressed. So, you know, ju uh, Justice John Holt in 1704 said, no government can subsist. No government can exist unless those who cause others to have an ill opinion of it are punished. So you can't bar something before it comes out, but if, it, if what comes out challenges government, well, then we again view things as, as sort of do or die and seditious libel comes in. Seditious libel is used heavily against dissenters and to keep troublesome materials from the lower classes, particularly and most famously Thomas Paine's rights of man in the 1790s, which used plain language uh, to celebrate the French National Assembly's recognition of the right to speak freely, of freedom of speech being a natural right that we're born with. Of course, rights of man also advocated what was effectively a welfare state, free education, pensions, etc. Nothing could be more of a seditious libel than his book, and it was immediately banned. Um, his publisher pled guilty. He absconded to France. Where else? He was tried in absentia. And it's interesting, during that trial, the, the government didn't hide its motivations. It said that the book was seditious because it was sold on the cheap, and also because it was addressed, addressed to those, quote, whose minds cannot be supposed to be conversant with subjects of this sort, meaning no, this shouldn't go to those classes. Even you know the ones that the book was addressed to, they're not advanced enough for this. Okay, so of course he lost, and the pro the trial and the prosecution, however, just juiced sales, and the book was every place. Censorship doesn't work. After the French Revolution and the Na Napoleonic Wars, throughout the 19th century, which is what I'll be talking about the most from now on, censorship was focused on controlling the media and information is made accessible to the poor. Everything, according to the historian E.P. Thompson, was turned into a battleground of class. And it's, it's really true. I mean, after the American and the French revolutions and with the revolts that blew up in 1830 in France, 1848 everywhere, 1870 again in France and, and throughout, there was pressure and, and um, the censorship measures that were prodigious throughout this century could were seen can almost be seen as a Rorschach test for the fears authorities felt for the unwashed masses, and that since many of these fears were irrational, uh, so were what they were doing. Such as Austria 
in the 1830s, I think it was, banned the word liberty, liberté, from um, China boxes. Russia banned the words free air in cookbooks as applied to ovens. I mean, crazy. Why? Because these revolutions showed that subversive ideas, when widely circulated, can actually cause problems for the ruling classes. They're, 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 this was the period in the 19th century when really the opinions of the underclasses began to matter, not because the elites wanted to actually address their concerns or help them, but because they were seen as threatening. So even questions about literacy or education were framed in terms of revolution. As an ignorant poor, for many, was seen to be a pliable one. German conservatives were complaining that excessive reading made for social un unrest. That's the word, excessive. And moral decline, particularly, and even psychological disabilities among servants, among youth, and among loose, loose women. You got to keep them from reading too much. Spain's prime minister, Murillo, in, the, in, the, in 1850, this is what he said, it's amazing. You want me to allow a school for working men? Uh, no, 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 no. Here we don't want men who think, we want oxen who work. Uh, and more pointedly, Fr Fr France's president, Edouard Thiers, said, in his view, education, the purpose of it was to show the lower orders that suffering is necessary, and that when the poor have a fever, is not the rich who gave it to them. The barbarians that threatened society, as a, a French legislator said in the 30s, were the working classes of our manufacturing towns. And by barbarism, he meant demands for political, that is voting, particularly labor and, and economic rights, all of which were equated with re rebellion. So print, of course, is heavily censored, but even what concerned elites even more was non-printed media, such as caricature, such as images, and particularly theater. A large portion of the population were still quite illiterate, but it was seen that theater and performance had a more visceral impact on the, on the lower classes. So the same plays were often barred for one group but allowed for another. Here's what an Austrian censor said in the turn of the century, the turn of the 19th century. He said, censorship of the theater must be much stricter than normal censorship of printed matter. Censorship of books can make them accessible only to a certain kind of reader, interesting, and channel it. Whereas the playhouse is open to all. Hmm. And after the revolutions of 1848, a French theater censor, this is astounding. They, they just weren't, they, were, they weren't hiding it. He said this, in seeing passages with a political or social significance, we asked ourselves, does this aim at causing the different classes to rise up against each other, to excite the poor against the rich, to excite disorder? We asked if it was possible to allow the ridicule of institutions and to expose them to laughter. We had no trouble in answering no. So that's it. Everything was viewed in a political realm and, excuse me, in a, through a political lens and uh, through the risk that a play could excite to the lower orders. It's interesting. Uh, 1826, the Austrians required that a popular production of King Lear be rewritten so the king didn't go crazy and die. I don't know how that could possibly be achieved, because that is the play, but they didn't want the, the middling or the lower classes to see uh, a king in such abject circumstances and to die so horribly. Um, that's how it was viewed. You know, even Tolstoy found that it, it, after a personal appeal by his wife, his Kreuzer Sonata was only allowed not in a cheap singular edition, but as part of a larger set. The czar himself said, well, no one's gonna, you know, who's gonna read it when, 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 or who, how can I put it? When it's published expensively, only the rich who can afford these sets can, 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 can get to it. But the main concern of censors in the 19th century, at least in Britain in the first half, was religion, was speech challenging religion. Because, not that because elites took God terribly seriously, there still is this sort of blood, bloodless observance of, of, of Christianity, but they thought that religion would keep the masses docile, religious observance. 
help them to tolerate their poverty and humiliation uh, in exchange for a lovely afterlife. You know, Eric Hobsbawm, uh, a historian I admire enormously, put it like this, the, the laboring poor were considered too ignorant or stupid to do without a socially useful su superstition. And the aim of authorities was to keep those superstitions alive. And this is also a time when the cities of course were growing and were less religious, at least the lower classes were less religious now than ever before. The church was, was losing its appeal bit by bit. And of course, the boogeyman behind all this was the American Revolution, which was effectively irreligious, and the French Revolution, which was in so many ways anti-religious, uh, an assault on the Catholic Church. In post-1815, there was a lot for elites to be concerned about. After the Napoleonic Wars, there was a depression. Basically, there was widespread unrest huge demands, louder, louder, louder demands for expansion of the voting franchise, and the ideas of Payne and others were circulating. And rather than addressing these concerns, the government tried to hold the line. This is done very soon after this century turned, uh, as I mentioned, about taxes on the burgeoning press, rest restrictions on meetings, other measures, but, th but also through aggressive censorship of irreligious speech, particularly when it made available to the poor. There were actually hundreds of trials for blasphemy against leftist speakers. It also, seditious libel thrown, thrown into this, but blasphemy being the main offense. Church and government were seen as codependent, okay? An assault on one being an assault on, on the other. And not to believe, at least when it was the poor, was to threaten wealth. And the, center, and the centerpiece of these efforts by the British government was really the Payne's book, Age of Reason, written when he was in France in the 1890s, which really was kind of a blasphemy extravaganza. Uh, it attacked the Bible as a collection of lies and absurdities, uh-oh, called Christianity a heathen mythology, and called the Immaculate Conception an obscene tale of a young woman debauched by a ghost. Hmm. Well, it was forbidden as, as a infected out product, product of the French Revolution, and it was the subject of many, many blasphemy uh, prosecutions. It's interesting. It was even too much for the lawyer who defended pain in rights of man, Thomas Erskine, one of the great attorneys ever. Um, he couldn't take it. It was too much for him. Rights of man, fine. You know, basic civil rights, fine. Attacks on religion, uh-uh. So he actually participated in the prosecution of a few people for that book. But the main advocate of was, of course, Richard Carlyle. He, uh, Leonard Levy, the historian, said he achieved more for free press in than anyone in English history. Not sure if that's true, but if it is not, it's pretty close. He was Age of Reason's biggest champion. He's one of these characters who arises in history who just can't stop. Yeah, he's one of these people who throws his body against the machine of the state for a cause no matter what happens to him or really those around him. It wasn't through brilliance. It wasn't through any particularly new ideas. It was through his relentlessness, his impudence on pushing radical speech, on publishing despite bans, on, 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 on being prosecuted and losing. Um, he, and his worship of pain that he became this sort of martyr very, very well known and sort of, be, and not sort of, very much moved the cause of free speech. I mean, he even named one of his kids after Payne. I mean, there, there was no, he didn't hold back. He spent about nine years in jail, six of which for pushing uh, and publishing Age of Reason. And also his family, and much of his family ended up in jail, as did his followers. He was charged so many times, I can't even keep track. Okay, a little background on him. He was a tinsmith. He became radicalized after he lost his job. He read Age of Reason in 1818. He became a theist and a publisher, and very quickly sort of joined the cause. There was a massive, terrible event that happened in 1819 called the Peterloo Massacre, which was this large gathering of people in Manchester uh, to, to agitate for expansion of voting. If Carlisle himself was supposed to speak, um, it became a police riot. About 11 people were trampled by, by uh, horse, uh, by mounted police, many, many others were injured. 
Uh, Carlisle never got to speak, ran back to London, wrote about it in inflamed terms, was shut down, and then was finally charged. Um, you know, some of the existing charges against him were brought up as well as this. And the main charge, though, that the prosecutors thought they could win was for blasphemy for age of reason. And his trial, which happened in 1819, was one of about 100 blasphemy prosecutions alone, brought that year alone for, uh, for leftist speech. Again, during his trial, the Crown wasn't making any they weren't hiding what they were doing. They made clear that blasphemy was a class crime. The prosecutor said that the gospel was preached particularly for the poor, to help them bear up against the misery of their misfortune. The rich, he said, could metabolize, or could, could, could handle pain, but not the poor. When such things got to the poor, he said, the consequences are too frightful to be contemplated. Exactly the same thing Lord Ellenborough said that I quoted a few minutes ago just the existence of the speech will turn things upside down. Well, Carlisle never missed an opportunity to make a spectacle and he tried to subpoena the Archbishop of Canterbury for the trial, as well as the chief rabbi. He also tried to prove that Payne's attacks on religion were correct. The judge was having none of it, absolutely none of it, and said he would not let Carlisle go to the truth of Christianity. But it's interesting, of course, here's the spoiler, Carlisle lost, but, he won for losing, okay? He read the entirety of the Age of Reason into the record. Uh, it took him 12 hours during the court. His wife then published, you could publish then court records. His wife then published court records, published Age of Reason as a court record for pennies, instantly sold about 10,000 copies. Okay, you know, he won, he lost for winning or win or won for, won for losing. Um, so many of his supporters ended up in jail, as well as his wife, that they ended up publishing a newsletter from Newgate Prison. And finally, in the 1820s, the government, the British government sort of gave up. You know, they, it was just worn out. They stopped prosecuting the book in the 1820s. And as Leonard Levy said, the British government slowly learned that it had to find a way to tolerate a free press. Uh, we were certainly not done at that point, but the, but you know, in the face of people like, like Carlisle and the others, even the government's gonna learn that censorship doesn't work. So by mid-century, blasphemy prosecutions had largely run their course, although they revived somewhat in the 1870s, and this is in the sexual realm. This is one or two more things I'm gonna talk about. There was a book circulating, and it had been circulating for years with an fairly deceptive title called Fruits of Philosophy. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with philosophy unless you consider sexual intercourse philosophy because what it was was effectively a marriage manual, but more truthfully, a birth control manual. Whatever birth control was really um, effective back then. And it, the book had been circulating for decades in pricey editions that only you know the upper middle class or the wealthy could afford, but Charles Bradlaugh and Annie Besant uh, decided that that was something that the lower classes needed to read. So they published it, a cheap edition, and instantly they were uh, prosecuted for uh, obscenity. What was useful information to the rich became, in the words of the prosecutor, lewd and filthy. Now, Charles Bradlaugh called it out. He said during the trial that it was horrible that we should be if, that we should be charged for giving information to the poor, which may impunity be given to the rich. Annie Besant argued that this was critical information for poor women to have for their health, to keep them from the constant pregnancies that are, and to keep families at a manageable size, you know, so for all the obvious reasons. Well, uh, it wasn't so obvious to the, to the jury or the judge and they lost their case. Uh, it was overturned on a technicality later. I forgot exactly what it was, having nothing to do with the merits. But still, Annie Besant lost custody of her child for the sin of publishing Fruits of Philosophy in a cheap edition. In the later part of the century, in the 1880s, there were prosecutions against publishers for publishing French, excuse me, translations of Emile Zola. So books that were okay and not prosecutable when in French, that is when allowed only to an audience who spoke it, 
when translated, that is made more uh, available, uh, they became obscene. And even the London Times, this is in 1888, said everyone's most would agree that publication of cheap translations of Zola's novels is a grave offense against public morals. Again, it's not the book that changes, it's the audience. And when the audience changes, then the government begins to get interested. Okay, I think I'm about done with my time. Um, I could go on. You know, I've just given you all um, a taste of a portion of my book. You know, I'd be glad to discuss censorship issues. You know, a full third of the book is covers the 20th century and the 21st centuries. I'd be glad to discuss whatever you wish. Uh, it's an absolute honor. And um, I'm going to call up Deborah because uh, she's in charge of all this. Thank you very much for that talk, Eric. Um, it's interesting and it's regrettable that it actually kind of is an important subject now as well. You would have thought that uh, the major battles would have been fought already. Um, I'm going to open the mic to Nicole, who's asked a question. Nicole, would you like to speak? You're muted at the moment, but if you unmute yourself, you could ask this question. Hi, Nicole. Perhaps she's just run off to put the kettle on. Um, I'll ask her. <laughs> okay. Pour some for me, please, Nicole. All right, just, no, no, she's not unmuting. Okay, uh, Nicole says, good afternoon. So I'm sure she's enjoying herself listening to you. It seems as if historical censorship was imposed from the top down. Today, it would appear as if censorship is also being imposed from the bottom up, i.e. the media censorship of former President Trump. Have there been any historical precedents of this? That is an absolutely fascinating question, which is making sparks come out of my ears. I don't know if Zoom can really pick that up. Has there ever been censorship from the, you know, from, as she said, as Nicole said, the bottom up? I can't really think of many examples other than, you know, well, John Stuart Mill had, had a, you know, let's talk about this. In, in the mid 19th century, he published, of course, his seminal on liberty. And, and that is one of the most beautifully written you know, books arguing for liberty of speech. And most of his book was, was, was addressed to speech as, as Nicole would say, from the top down, that is you know, to require tolerance from authorities of even obnoxious minority speech. But he also spoke of something called social tyranny, which, which he said was even worse than tyranny from above, which is, tyranny, which is the conformity that is, that is formed from our peers. He called it the tyranny of the majority, but he defined majority as being the loudest minority, meaning that, and he said, you know, that could censor legal speech, that speech that the government wouldn't, wouldn't uh, necessarily censor. So I think, Nicole, wherever you are, that kind of conformity, shame, uh, you know, uh, guild level speech, speech from our peers, from those around us, which, which entrap our minds and keep us from saying things, uh, has always been there. It just hasn't really been recorded as it would be from the government. And I think Twitter, you said from the bottom up, I would, I, I, I would put Twitter and social media somewhere between the bottom and the top, somewhere between your average citizen whose speech it hosts and governments which have the authority to define or kill you. They, they exist under government authority, but also they transcend government authority. And that's what I think is really driving a lot of things. So um, I'm not sure if I fully answered that, except for the fact that I think that the mill defined social tyranny really has always existed. It's in full flower now, absolutely. Um, Bornatz here has asked me to ask um, their question on their behalf because they don't have a microphone. Um, the question is, in the UK, speech which promotes racial hatred, hatred is prohibited. Yeah. Uh, this hasn't solved the problem of racial hatred, but members of minority groups, um, gypsies, South Asians, Jews, for example, might perhaps feel a little protected would they be right? Okay, so this is a great audience. Um, the, 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 
this goes to exactly what I was trying to talk about. I, 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 I can speak for myself, okay? That, and I'm not, I don't stand apart from any of this. I identify very, very strongly with being Jewish. And when, and when I hear anti-Semitic speech, it hurts me. I feel dark, I feel miserable. In, in many ways, I feel scared. But at the same time, I know that by the government or Twitter or whomever, when they stop that speech, that's, they're not stopping the speaker. They're not stopping the anti-Semitism itself or the racism itself that is coming. And I, I dearly, whereas I'm not going to degrade or insult the hurt that someone must feel, in, in hearing speech that addresses their own concerns, I, I, I really want to call this up that when we have speech restrictions, we, even though they sound good or they might make us feel good for the moment, we have to look at who's enforcing them, okay? I have two words, four words, <laughs> Donald Trump and Mark Zuckerberg. Imagine what hate speech rules would, be, would, would have been if Trump had, a, had enforcement power over them. Hate speech rules are often used to suppress dissent. Mandela was charged with hate speech. Gandhi was charged, jailed for it. Gandhi was charged with hate speech. So I'm not going to gainsay the hurt that someone feels. I just think that by sequestering certain kinds of speech to be forbidden, there's often un unintended effects and these rules can often be and, and almost always are abused by those with the authority to enforce them. We also have a question from Gregory James. I'm just going to unmute you, Gregory. So if you could unmute from your end and then uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Hello. Hello, thank you for a really, really interesting speech. Um, thank you. Could I just ask, um, in the UK at the moment, um, the BBC and Channel 4, uh, public broadcasting services, are being uh, censored and censored by the government. What, what can we do to try and maintain or, or achieve a genuine free and biased public service broadcaster? You know, I, I, I wish I knew the examples that you were talking about of the of BBC4 getting, getting censored, but um, I have a lot of concerns and I know that coming from the United States, the way we've conducted ourselves for the last four odd years, I don't have a lot of credibility, but speaking for myself, I have a lot of concerns of what's going on in the UK because there are so many measures going to speech. There's this rule that's being contemplated of having a free speech champion uh, for campuses and allowing anyone who feels they've been deplatformed to sue universities if they feel that that's been wrong and you know that that, that's going to be very troublesome and that's going to give a lot more power to government over speech on campus than has ever existed before. And you have this online safety bill in which the, there's going to be an affirmative duty to bar what's called lawful but awful speech, speech that might be legal on the street but would be forbidden because it's potentially harmful to someone somewhere online. There are developing many different standards of speech for the street, for online, for television. And I think it's going to be very, very hard to enforce. I hate to say this, Gregory, um, but I, I think that at the price of a lot more discord, the government needs to step back and it needs to allow, allow more discord because I think one, you know, I, my feelings about Trump aren't a secret at this point. Him being on Twitter, seeing that craziness every single day, I think it was instrumental in getting him, in helping his loss because his attitudes are right there at the public. When you suppress speech, it's not like the ideas go away. They just go somewhere else and a little more harmful. So in answer to your question, Gregory, I think um, the, I, I can't speak particularly to BBC, but I think that the government, particularly the, the government in power now, needs to be pressured to take a much lighter hand. It's an interesting point because, of course, they have to win elections and they're not working with the same background culture that you have in the United States of, um, you know, of, of, your, of the First Amendment. So 
Um, yeah, there are yeah. certain things that would be taken for granted in the United States that simply don't run through the culture the same way here. Well, in Europe, it's fascinating. I mean, everyone in the, in the Convention on Human Rights, there's, and in, there's this ringing affirmation of free speech followed immediately by a lot of exceptions, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for, for a democratic society, et cetera. Yes, I mean, there are the, you don't have the kind of bedrock protections that we have. And we have to remember the power's first imperative always is to maintain itself. And whatever they're going to use, whatever rules they have to do that, and that's even you know people that we like. They're, they're, that's just the nature of things. And that seems like absolutely the perfect encapsulation to finish the talk on, actually, because that's returning to that theme that you've been um, talking about throughout this whole uh, throughout this whole talk. Thank you ever so much for joining us, Eric, and uh, thank you for joining us um, as attendees. Uh, for ethical matters. Remember, we have a very busy program here at Conway Hall, so do keep an eye on the website to join us for the future. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us. And do remember that, like everybody else, for the last sort of 18 months or so, Conway Hall has had a hard financial time. If you've got any spare money and you can make a donation, we would be very grateful for it. Thank you ever so much to this afternoon for um, Anna Sexton doing the tech for us. And thank you behind the scenes to Jeff Davey and Scott Wood, who do an awful lot of organization for all of these. Thank you again, Eric, and we'll see you at it's the next It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs>